This is the Mooks and the Gripes podcast. Hello, everybody. It's so nice to, to come to you all. It is the day before October for us as we sit here recording, Saturday, September 30th. And Paul and I just did last week a Patreon bonus episode on how nice it is to be in the fall and the, the changing uh, weather, even though it's still been quite warm in some of the books that we're reading. Uh, but it's so, I, I don't know, I love this time of year. And so, you know, exciting to be back. This is Trevor multiplied by Paul. Paul, how are you doing today? I am doing well. I'm in the same spirit as you are. I'm, I'm enjoying this cooler weather and just ready for a transition. Summer, I always love it, but I'm also <laughs> done. I'm always done. I'm like, okay, it's time for something new. So, yeah. Very nice. Very nice to be back with you. And we are joined and excited to, to have a conversation with one of our good friends from uh, from online, uh, Rowan Mateson. Uh, Rowan, welcome to the show. I'm so excited to have you here. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here too. And I'm so looking forward to our chat. We're going to be talking about a, a, a topic that I will always go to Rowan uh, to, to learn more about Victorian literature. <laughs> I'm so excited. I, when, when we were uh, talking about having you on the show, Rowan, I, I, we always want our guests to pick something that they would like to talk about. We don't want to say, well, this is something we want to talk to with you about in case it doesn't doesn't work. But I, I guess a part of me was secretly hoping you would choose uh, Victorian <laughs> literature and that we didn't corner you into that. <laughs> so. No, the challenge will be to shut me up once I start talking about it, I think. <laughs> well, we're excited. Uh, I think we'll, we will fail at that challenge, hopefully. So. <laughs> right. And you'll, you'll fit right in with us if that's the case, too. <laughs> Excellent. Well, <clears throat> a few preliminary things before we jump into that. Uh, we do have a couple of new Patreon supporters that uh, I want to thank on on the show here at the beginning. Um, and both of these are folks that I know online. Uh, Liz Humphreys, thank you so much for joining in on Patreon. I hope that, you know, you enjoy the bonus shows that we put up there. Um, and then uh, Stu J. Allen. Stu, I have known you for ever since I think Twitter became a thing. Mm. Um, it has always been so nice to, to get on there. Uh, Stu is one of the first that I just I remember seeing his tweets of, hey, how's everyone doing tonight? Here's what I'm reading. Um, Translation Thursday, all of those kinds of things came with mm -hmm. uh, with Stu. And so it's very nice. Uh, thank you so much to both of you for joining on Patreon. And just so listeners who are aware, Patreon is, we, we do some bonus shows periodically that are just kind of random topics. They're not, they're not quite as, you know, we, we didn't want to make it so that they're, you had to join Patreon to get, you know, a topic like this on Victorian literature with Rowan, for example. Um, we just do kind of expanded tangents, maybe is a better way to put it. Um, but if that's your thing, um, those are available to any Patreon supporter at any level uh, whatsoever, whether it's a dollar a month or you know, um, one million dollars a month, which, right. which we only know, have a few we, of those. But... Only a few of those. We're still we're still seeking the you know the the, <laughs> the riches on this now, <laughs> and so we we very much appreciate it, and uh, thank you for for all of that. Um, thank with, you. With that, I I would like to ask Rowan, what have you been reading? Ah, well, one of the things is that I'm in the middle of my teaching term now. So my mm. recent reading, just for fun, is often kind of limited by that. And my reading for work is actually very relevant to our discussion today mm. because I'm teaching a course on the 19th century novel. And we just finished Pride and Prejudice, so I just reread that. <laughs> mm. And we're just starting in on Jane Eyre, so I've been reading that. But I do get in a little bit of reading uh, just for myself or sometimes for reviews. So one of the more recent things that I've read is Daniel Mason's new novel, Northwoods, which I really enjoyed i think i would say it's a it's a contribution to the genre that i guess gets called eco fiction mm -hmm. now a novel that tries to tell a story that's about the natural world and the human story combined so the humans are the protagonists in a way but nature is also kind of a protagonist and he tells a really um, I think compelling narrative by focusing on one particular house in a clearing in the in the woods of Massachusetts and all the different people who lived there over a course of about three four hundred years, and so the trees change and the insects change and the people change and everything is coming and going from this one location, so it gives them a chance to tell some really big stories, of course, including 
climate change over time, but also just some really dramatic stories. There's even a chapter from the point of view of, of a beetle, you know, it gives you, gives you the sense of, <laughs> of nature interacting with humans. So that was really an interesting read. And um, a, a Twitter favorite, uh, Claudia Pinheiro, I just read uh, A mm -hmm. Little Luck. I think uh, many people loved Elena Knows and that led them on to other of her books. So I found A Little Luck, maybe not as com convincing overall as Elena Knows, but still Pinheiro has such a way of of captivating you with the the intensity of her writing so that was mm. a really that was a really compelling read for me as well i st i still haven't read uh that one i i've had it uh since it was published and it just sits and i it's like one of those that i'm saving uh, maybe for October 1st. I don't know. but <laughs> I think you'll probably find once you start it, it does draw you along quite mm -hmm. rapidly. There's quite for a sure. lot of suspense built into it. She's got, um, the tactic is partly just withholding the information about what actually did happen. <laughs> what was the crisis that precipitated this this trauma that the protagonist is living through? But but once you find it out, then you're just really caught up in the whole question of of how much responsibility should you bear for something that's really a matter of a bit of bad luck? And is there hmm. a possibility of some good luck to, to compensate for it? And is there any hope for you know, coming back for atonement, for reconciliation? So it, it's characteristically, I think, um, morally weighty, but also just it, she has this capacity to create suspense, I think, just very hmm. quietly. No, oh, that's... Yeah. The, I, I do, I do feel more compelled to read it even uh, after that than than before, even though I've been looking forward to it. But yeah. well, th thank you, uh, Paul. Have, have you been reading anything? I haven't. You know, I just haven't been reading anything. Yeah, no, of course I have. Yeah, and also I will just say that Rowan's fitting in very well. She's already added two books to my TBR list, so Excellent. she's two for two. Yeah, no, Claudia Pinheiro. I loved her first book, and I've been really excited to read that second one, and then. The other book you described sounds wonderful, and it actually ties in um, pretty closely to the book that I've been reading, which is another one that for the Republic of Consciousness Prize. That's the theme lately for me because it's taken up a lot of my reading time. And this last one I read, I really liked. It's called Landscapes by Christine Lay. It's published by Two Dollar Radio, and I would also say that it probably qualifies as maybe that eco fiction that you were describing, Rowan. It's set in the not too distant future. It doesn't really specify, but you get the impression it's not too far down the road. And the world is facing, you know, all kinds of ecological impacts from things that we're seeing right now, but it's, you know, a little bit further down the road. So, you know, England, for example, is in the middle of some pretty massive droughts. And there's a lot of the the trees and the, the um, animals and insects have started to be impacted pretty severely. And it's narrated by a woman named Penelope, um, who's working to archive this library that is in a um, it's in a, a manor in the English countryside that is slowly falling into ruin. And she's lived there for a couple of decades. And there's all kinds, there's a big library there. There's a lot of artwork and things like that. And so the book is divided into different sections. Some of them are narratively driven by her. Other ones are little excerpts from her diaries. And then there's these other sections that are just little snippets of the cataloging work that she's doing. So it'll describe the end papers of a book and how much damage it has or the painting that's hanging on the wall. And so it's a really interesting theme because you can see the manor house is falling into disrepair and, and they're going to have to, to leave it. But obviously there's some clear tie-ins to what's happening in the natural world and this documenting of things that we're losing, the damage that's being done. Um, so it's really powerful, really wonderful writing. Um, a lot of, you know, the themes of, of loss and trauma and, like I said, preservation. And then there's also another plot that I wouldn't say is a subplot, but it's another, you know, plot that's working its way through the background involving a personal trauma that she's gone through. And it's going to kind of come to a head in the coming, you know, weeks, months as she's writing. So, yeah, I've seen it compared to a lot of artists who I love, you know, Ishiguru, Rachel Cusk. Um, Maria Gainza and then Judith Shalansky. So those are just some of the names that I see. I mean, I would also say that when you were talking about that book, Rowan, I, I got a little bit of a, a Jenny Erpenbeck vibe. I don't know if you've read any of her stuff, but I would say there's some of that in this book as well. But anyway, yeah, it's, it's absolutely wonderful. It touches a lot on artwork, which is something that I've talked about. Uh, J.M.W. Turner in particular, a lot of his paintings are brought up. So I'll just read really quickly a couple of short excerpts just to give people a taste. It says, as I work through the disorderly archive and chip away at the mountain of responsibilities, my mind is drawn back to this image of Turner's studio, left in a state of Pompeii-like destruction after the painter's death. 
That same atmosphere of decay permeates the library in which I spend my mornings. On better days, disorder is forestalled and there is only the linearity of the catalog and the neat collection of books and objects. On days of anxiety, such as today, I find myself stranded in the wreckage. The dust that is gathered in the corners, the moldy papers, the shelves that bend under the weight of books and archival boxes, all these seem to be advancing toward me, millimeter by millimeter, until they overwhelm me. So, you know, I, I won't read another one, but I think that's just a good, it captures the themes of what she's working on. But also for me, that style of writing is just wonderful. So yeah, anybody who hasn't heard of that one, I've actually seen a few people online who are posting it as a book they just purchased, which made me happy um, to see that it's kind of making its way out in the wild. But um, anybody who hasn't heard of it, I would encourage you to look it up and see if it's for you. But I absolutely love it. That sounds wonderful. Yeah. And it's interesting, the echoes with, with the Mason book. Mason um, plays also a lot with different genres. So different sections of his book have different sort of flavors, different characters. And one of the sections is about a, a landscape painter. As oh, happens. interesting. It's a fictional painter, as far as I could find out. Um, but it does talk a lot about, again, the, the relationship between art and the natural world and mm -hmm. how you try to depict in painting what you see happening around you and how that maybe compares to your know, narrative is moving forward, but a painting is kind of in, in the in the moment. I wonder if um, one of the challenges for something that's got this eco-fictional angle is, is the risk of getting too didactic, which I suppose is something that might come up in our discussion about 19th century literature. <laughs> but I think certainly Mason... Um, manages to avoid that, I think, by being so playful in, in the various different kinds. He has some sort of gothic bits, some ghost story bits. Some, mm -hmm. There's just a lot of different kinds. There's a kind of true crime, lurid true crime narrative that's part of it. So even though the the movement towards that scary looking future is is an overarching kind of shadow, um, it doesn't make you feel like you're being hectored about it. I, I wonder if that was true of of the book you're talking about as well. Yeah, I didn't feel like I was being hectored. I was trying to think. I wouldn't say that it's playful. It's it's pretty introspective and, um, I don't know, somber. Maybe not somber. That's probably not the right word. But I wouldn't say playful. But at the same time, I didn't really feel like it was didactic. But I agree with you. That is something that would get my hackles up if I felt like I was being, you know, even if it's something that I'm very much on board with, like, there can be that tone that just doesn't sit right. This one, I don't know what it is, but she manages to avoid that. And one thing I didn't mention, this is her first novel, which I think I talked about this last time or the time before. Every once in a while, you come across these initial novels where somebody comes out so strong out of the gates, and it's always almost extra impressive that somebody can do that right from the very beginning. So yeah, no, but yeah, that that is a, a very interesting point you made. And I was thinking of Richard Powers, The Overstory which I loved and I would definitely fall in this category. And I was trying to think, you know, maybe some people would think that one had certain sections that were a little bit didactic, but for me, it works. Maybe if it was a topic that I didn't align with so much, maybe I'd be a little more sensitive to it though. I don't know. Yeah, I haven't read that, but I read his, uh, I think his more recent novel, Bewilderment, and I just loved it, even though I know other people have found it unpleasantly didactic. So you mm -hmm. never quite know how things will hit, but it certainly made me more interested in, in Overstory. And, and now you're also making me think I should I should certainly give it a try. Yeah, I would. I loved it for sure. <laughs> Trevor, do you have something right on the same theme? Eco, no. Eco fiction? Oh, no, okay. no. It, uh, in fact, so... Um... I am still reading uh, War and Peace and the Brothers Karamazov and also The Voyage Out by Virginia Woolf. Mm. I thought that that um, online reading read along of Virginia Woolf's The Voyage Out was a September only thing like that that was being scheduled to finish at the end of September. No, I've still got another week left on it and I am really enjoying it. It it's it's not as good as, you know, that my my favorite Virginia Woolf novels. I wasn't expecting it to be so um but yeah, I still have another week of that, another like year of, uh, of War and Peace and certainly another like 3 months of The Brothers Karamazov if I'm reading them a chapter a day, uh which I think, you know, at times well will speed up. But I found myself in kind of a weird situation this weekend uh because we we start tomorrow for NYRB Women 2023, um, a new book. We start Mavis Gallant's um, A Fairly Good Time, which I'm really excited about. But also, I haven't brought this up for a while, Paul, but it's the start of the fourth quarter of 2023, 
uh, the year of Sanderson. <laughs> and oh, so yeah. tonight's the night at midnight that we get um, the last of his four secret projects, you know, his novels that he wrote during the lockdown. Mm-hmm. And so I thought, what am I going to read today? You know, um, when I have two books, I'm starting tomorrow and I'm already reading all of these other ones. So I went with a short book that I've been excited about and it's uh, Rosalind Belbin's The Limit. Uh, recently republished uh, by NYRB Classics. Apparently, I mean, it says in their little blurb, this altogether singular, remarkable novel has been as good as unobtainable for decades. Hmm. And so it it's, it's there. It's very short. It's 100 pages. And it has a lot of really interesting uh, chapter titles that I was like, what? what are we getting into here? Like the very first one is The Passage of a Soul at Death into Another Body. And then it has little uh, uh, pieces in italics that are from other like medical books and things like that. Uh, But here's how it starts. The woman stirs. I sit at my bedside watching because I cannot. There is no way in to enter her. She is cut off, not with me. I not with her. I imagine it is myself. It is the nearest that I can in memory and mind do for her. That woman is my wife. And then it goes on. He sat perfectly still as if in a trance, but see his eyelids move up and down. He is blinking a tiny flexing in his hand. His hands are streaked like a seal's back. He is holding the dry hair. They are together clasped in the lap. It's an interesting, uh, you know, that, Part of the reason I read that maybe a little bit different than I would with little pauses is there are stray commas thrown in at period at places. It's, it's punctuated a little bit differently than you would expect. And it it kind of shows it, to me a little bit of this strange halting coming along and then a little bit of a, of a, of a jerk, because what we have here is a husband um, who is uh, it's his last moments of his wife's life. And she can no longer talk or communicate. And while it does go back and forth in time, um, so this isn't the only moment for 100 pages, this is the beginning. And it's this, the, I, I don't know what the limit is referring to yet, but it, the, definitely getting some, some ideas of just their, their limits of, mm. of being together and yet you know, as it said there, here they are together. You know, there's something about being together and, and recognizing that they're not. And it's, um, it's been, a, I'm not very far yet. Again, I started it last night thinking, oh, what am I going to read between now and <laughs> October 1st? Uh, but it's something else. Uh, yeah. So. Sounds like it. Is that, when did they republish that one? Is that a pretty new one? Just, yep. Just barely like okay. uh, September something. Oh, okay. Yeah, I hadn't yeah. heard about that one. It sounds and very intriguing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very, very short, very, uh, very easy just to to grab and and I think I'll be able to get through it no problems uh, today, because yeah. it's also very, uh, very swift, compelling reading. <laughs> and then <laughs> Brandon Sanderson going. comes out at midnight, and you're going to throw all your other books out the window and just read that. Stay up all night. Yeah, no. <laughs> Pop some popcorn. I am, know, ex- just... I am excited, but I'm not quite a. I, I'll, I, if I'm awake at midnight, I will regret it. So, <laughs> right. I'm with you on that. Yeah, me too, for sure. <laughs> uh, but it's always so fun this time of year. You know, I, I've got slews of things that I want to read. There are more books coming out in October that I just, ah, oh, it, mm-hmm. so we'll see how many of them we can get through, but, uh, but keep being excited about them all. Yeah. And it's always a little frustrating for me at this time of year because I get <laughs> so inundated with first year papers and so on that I see all the books on the horizon and I just have to hmm. know that I'll, I'll I'll have to defer a lot of them. So I make a lot of notes of things I'm hoping to kind of put on my, my wish list and, and get to them when I can. Even <laughs> if I have time to read, sometimes I just, I can't bring myself to read anymore by the end mm, of the day. Oh, yeah. So. Yeah. You've, you've spent that, that kind of, uh, of, 
mental uh, <laughs> energy. Yeah, oh. that, that precious capacity. So I guess that's one reason to be grateful that I always do get to teach at least one thing where I'm reading books I just really love for class. I mean, it's really not a hardship to be rereading Jane Eyre, although, you know, always when I listen to you two talking about your reading, I think you read so much and so widely, and I'm rereading over and over again <laughs> the same books to make sure I have them straight before I show up for class. Yeah. And there's, there, we've had, I, I myself have learned a lot of the power of rereading this year. Um, so yeah, we, we can each look at the other and say, that sounds nice, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I'm, I am grateful for, for, uh, the way that I have it, um, where reading is, is, isn't part of my, my day-to-day -day job. Um, as much as I also sometimes think, oh, wouldn't that be, wouldn't that be nice? I know that there are downsides to it as well. <laughs> So, all right, well, we are here to talk about Victorian literature. And I think while most people, when we say Victorian literature, they it, a thing comes to mind that's probably pretty accurate. But I want to make sure that I'm not just making an assumption there. Uh, you're teaching a class this term on the 19th century novel. Uh, and uh, it, there would seem to be a distinction between that as a class subject and Victorian literature. Um, you know, Queen Victoria, who was named after she was, she reigned from what, 1830, 37, 1837 to 1901. Yeah. And that's a big period of time, but it's not the whole 19th century. And, and I also think of, of Victorian literature as being a, a very much an English, uh, you know, novel, not American, not Italian, even though, of course, there's plenty going on in Russia and, you know, I'm reading to, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, novels that, that would apply, uh, to that. But uh, am I right in those assumptions, Rowan, or am I a little bit off on my boundaries or? No, you're exactly right. And the thing about boundaries or periods or the attempt to categorize is that it's always a fiction, right? Mm -hmm. It's a useful fiction. It's a necessary artifice. You need to decide, even if it's just for curriculum reasons, you need to start <laughs> somewhere and stop somewhere. So you need some sense of boundaries. I think there's also, um, there are moments or periods where, where there are trends or things you feel you can generalize about. I mean, in history, we might say, well, we all know that, say, the 1950s in American history were different than the 1960s. But it's not like someone woke up on January 1st, 1960 and said, everything's different today. Uh -huh. So there's a sense that, yeah, there's a time when you can say this. Now we're sort of squarely in the Victorian period. It's probably somewhere between the 1840s and the 1870s. And that's not marking it out strictly by Victoria's reign. Mm. So when people start to to do these things, they look for reasons. Why do we start where we start and why do we end where we end? And they're always going to be kind of arbitrary but useful. So the courses I teach, one is called the 19th century British novel from Austin to Dickens, and the other is called the 19th century British novel from Dickens to Hardy. And those are the useful fictions that my uh, now retired colleague and I came up with that, mm. that we thought, let us do two kinds of things. One is the, the novel from around Austin forward and then the other is the novel from the middle of the century kind of towards when you know you're into the modern period so we kind of shelved the question of will we call it victorian but that means i'm always having to also make sure my students don't say well austin was a victorian novelist you know things mm. like that because mm -hmm. that doesn't really make sense but people often start the victorian period not in 1837 but in 1832 and that's because that's the passage of the first reform bill in England and also the death of Sir Walter Scott. And so you pick, well, if you know the romantic period is over at some point, it's maybe when Scott dies. And so after that, you have something new. And then I tend to end the Victorian period, you know, 1880-ish, because after that, you're getting into the, you know, Oscar Wilde and the fin de siècle and the aesthetic mm -hmm. movement and something else is going on. And, but yeah, it's all just, it's all just because we need something, right? Um, George Eliot says every limit is a beginning as well as an ending, right? And that's we're always putting these <laughs> these things in place. But everybody that we call a Victorian novelist read Austen and Scott, for instance. So it's hard to teach a course on the later 19th century novelists if you never get a chance to say, and you know, here's who they were reading and building on and talking about themselves. You know, these were touchstone. It's hard now to imagine um, how much they loved Scott because nobody really reads Scott anymore. Yeah. <laughs> it was, not not anybody who wasn't made to. Right. Yeah, right. And yet Jane Austen, you know, continues to power on and, and become as popular or more popular than ever. It's that's a really interesting point. Yeah, and in fact it, it can be for for the course that I'm teaching now, the Austin to Dickens version, it can almost be a 
an impediment because her popularity is so great that people know things that they they kind of think they know about Austen or they know Pride and Prejudice really well from watching multiple adaptations of it but not from reading it or if they've read it they've had a kind of love affair with it that means they're not used to having to analyze it or take mm -hmm. it apart in any way or mm -hmm. ask questions about what the things mean they just are deeply invested in their idea of it and the enthusiasm is just wonderful but sometimes it's also a little bit overwhelming and you never have that problem when you're, when you're teaching Scott because they're all coming to it absolutely <laughs> clean of any previous impressions. So I try to appreciate the Austin effect. It's a guaranteed thing. You put Austin in the title of a course, people will come and take it. And there, I don't think that in my area of teaching, there's any other novelist who will do that. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. That is fascinating. I love, I love talking about these boundaries and these, these limits or, or, or these transitionary periods. Um, Paul and I will often part of I, I think some of our more interesting conversational bits is when we're trying to figure out what when we say we're talking about X, Y or Z on this day, what does that mean and what doesn't it mean and why? You know, those are always some of my favorite uh, mm -hmm. parts of our conversations because uh, it just it, it it leads to that analysis of these what what's different, what's the same, how do we distinguish it, how do we relate it? So and, when you say Victorian, what do you two tend to mean? Like, or what do you assume are kind of the associations that are generally had for it? I think for me, it's very much what you just said with the 1840s to, you know, 1870s, 1880, because when I was just typing, you know, Victorian novelists and like Oscar Wilde or Victorian English writers, you know, Oscar Wilde pops up and I'm like, mm, that doesn't that doesn't sit. And then I'm like, well, of course he is, if we're going just by the dates of Victoria's reign. So for me, it's more of the, you know, the, the Dickens, the, mm -hmm. the, the George Eliot, the, um, you know, the big, the big books, the, the big thick books that talk about social issues and, and are, are more examining that. And then you throw in just for fun, you know, something like Wuthering Heights, you know, to show that it's not all Dickens and it's, mm -hmm. it, there is a bit of a strangeness, but, but that's on the early part of Victorian. So when I think Victorian, I'm very much into the, you know, the Dickens, uh, I guess is, is what comes to mind. It's like, so it has more to do mm -hmm. with, the, with some qualities of yeah. the, of the mm -hmm. books, not so much with the chronology. I mean, I think that yeah. intuitively that makes sense to me too. And in fact, I've seen uh, publishers catalogs put Wuthering Heights under romantic novelists, even though chronologically, mm -hmm. again, that doesn't mm -hmm. make any sense because there's a sense that, that it is such an anomalous book. And even Jane Eyre can sometimes, you can feel like it's, it's doing something that doesn't maybe always feel very Victorian. I often do an informal kind of go around with my students and say, well, what, what associations, you know, outside of this class and say, you know, don't be afraid of hurting my feelings. Do you have with the word <laughs> Victorian? If someone says, oh, these are very Victorian values, or that's a very Victorian style. Mm. And, and a lot of things come up and they have to do with like earnestness, stuffiness, prudishness, uh, you know, the whole, you can't show your legs, you can't show the piano legs, the, the sense of um, Queen Victoria saying, we are not amused. <laughs> you know, it's really a humorless stereotype. It's yeah. a really moralizing stereotype. Sometimes they have some good things to say too, but I invite them just to say, what are the popular conceptions or misconceptions? If, if you just ask someone, what does the word Victorian mean to them? And it does tend to be in that kind of zone. So I'm sure neither of you go quite in that pejorative direction, but I bet some of that rings true, right? Sure. Oh, yeah. 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 And I was going to say, I mean, for me, some of the things I think about is, is a lot of what you both have mentioned, but often they are the big books, but that's because they're filled with these rabbit trails these long sentences you follow them off into some alley and and meet all these characters i mean a lot of this is dickens of course but not just dickens and yeah. so i think what i love about victorian literature and one of the things that draws me to it when i'm in the right mood is in our day and age where everything is concise and bullet points and fast paced and it's mm -hmm. all about productivity and how quickly can we get through this if i'm in the right mood i will follow those digressions and go meet some you know, character who's like, you know, you know, an orphan or, you know, whatever, like I, I will do that all day long because it's so nice to just kind of be led by the hand and wander along and enjoy all that. So I really do like that part of it. And then something I'm going to talk about with several of my books today is the societal norms that you mentioned, Rowan. I mean, it's always intriguing to see them through today's lens, but I also like how that kind of puts some 
it, it kind of impact the plots and like add these complications that, you know, some of these books, if they took place in the modern era, you know, the problem would be solved in two seconds by a text or, you know, that whole thing. Like, so I actually really like going back and or having like some if the, of if the hero and heroine could just spend half an hour alone together <laughs> right. to each other, yeah. just talk it out. Being kept apart <laughs> because they're not allowed to be, yes, because it would just yeah. be so improper for them to, to be, have any privacy. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. And <laughs> I know that would dr- drive some people crazy, but I actually really enjoy it. Just the money, the inheritance we talked about with Jane Austen, the gender roles and how that adds complications that wouldn't yeah. necessarily impede them today. But I really find it fascinating and compelling yeah. to go back and kind of see it through their yeah. eyes. We, when we were just recently talking about Pride and Prejudice in my class, and I, I highlighted the moment when Elizabeth is visiting Pemberley and Mr. Darcy comes around the corner and their eyes meet and they both, it says, the you know, deepest blush, you know, across both mm-hmm. of their faces. And I said, you know, that's one of the top 10 sexy moments in 19th century literature. <laughs> and it, it's so sexy. It's so erotic because it none of it can be made explicit you know you Absolutely. need to find some way to signal that there's something really powerful that they both feel when they see each other there's a little bit of embarrassment and awkwardness to be sure but but blushing in the sense that the blood outside of your control is going anywhere in your body you know just to bring that up is <laughs> it it's you know we've mm-hmm. lost the capacity to to create that kind of little thrill because you can just spell everything out now uh, there's a moment in the middle of the floss where someone kisses someone's arm. It's like, oh, I can't mm-hmm. believe that just happened. You know, it's <laughs> oh, exciting. And uh, sometimes that is lost on on this generation. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Oh, dang. And it definitely, it, it does, it works so beautifully sometimes. It's so subtle and it gets you into the things these characters maybe are embarrassed to acknowledge um, yeah. that we do relate to, you know, in, in our own in, in my own life, I'm not explicit with everything, even to myself with what I'm feeling. And so to be able to have that subtlety where I agree too often today, we, 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 we would just read right over that and probably not even, no one would even write it that way. Um, yeah. It would be much yeah. more, more, you know, on the nose. And <laughs> that's yeah. actually something that bothers me about adaptations. A lot of times is they, they take it out of, of what would be, realistic for that time period to make things a lot more steamy for today, for example. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. and I'm sometimes I'm like, I don't know, maybe the books were wrong. And then I, I think, well, but it is about the way that they would uh, approach these topics and the way they would think about them, that the books have right. And, that and some sometimes of the what stuff it does is it reduces have... that, that um, attraction or that relationship or what I'm calling that sexiness. It reduces it to something physical when mm-hmm. often it's, it's more than that. And it can be yeah. ideas and thoughts and a kind of affinity that is something else. And, and to insist that it has to be played out in this very you know, overt way. Yeah. It loses some of those dimensions and, and uh, definitely say with Elizabeth and Mr. Darcy, it's a, it's a meeting of the minds, right? It's a, it's a romance of the intellect as much as anything, but that's hard to show on screen, isn't it? Mm, (laughs) How do you show people thinking (laughs) differently about each other? It's tricky. (laughs) Well, I could, you know, have, I could have plenty to say about adaptations, but maybe I'll, I'll hold my fire on that and see if it comes up. (laughs) Oh, I still do love them, you know, for, for all of, for all of them. I'm often sitting around thinking, I'd like to watch a show tonight. It better be a good period piece, you know. <laughs> um, but what are what are what are some of your earlier, um, you know, before it became part of your profession to teach and to, you know, uh, read and 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 study and then and then teach the Victorian uh, or well the British novel. But we'll talk about uh, Victorian literature for today's uh, topic. Though of course, let's we can blur that uh, as much as you want. Um, what are some of your earlier memories? I assume it, you weren't just like, I'd so much rather teach, you know, another topic, but I got it. This is the only one available. It seems because of your passion and your ability to, 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 I think, show that online on Twitter, even to those of us who aren't your students, that there's something, there is a, a real affinity that probably started before you, you started, uh, that became your career. Yeah, I, I think there there definitely is. I mean, I was a, a stereotypical nerdy bookish girl, you know, as a reader from extremely young age. I grew up in a house where, where books were everywhere. In fact, we didn't have a television until after all the children had moved out. My parents didn't have a television in the house. So reading was what we what we did. And like a lot of um, of teenage girls, for instance, who were very bookish, I read books like Jane Eyre and Wuthering Heights and Pride and Prejudice as as part of of it was partly aspirational, right? I wanted to be the kind of person who who read these serious books. And I'm sure Mm -hmm. I read a lot of them before I could make any sense out of them. 
Um, but I never had any thought that this was a long term plan for me. Um, even when I went to university, I planned to be a history major and I only became an English major um, when it when I realized in my first English class that being a reader wasn't enough. You know, I thought, well, I can already read. Why do I need English classes? And mm. I said, oh, well, this is why to have these conversations and do these other things. So that was a turning point, definitely. But if if even that point, someone had said, what would you focus on? I would have resisted probably saying Victorian fiction. And this is partly because in the most cliched sort of way, I was I was rebelling just a little bit against what I grew up with, especially my, my father, who is a devotee of the 19th century novel and a huge lover of Anthony Trollope, especially. So he had all of Trollope's novels and read them all the time. He loved the Palliser's adaptations. And it wasn't that it was hostile. I just thought, well, that's kind of his territory, you hmm. know, and, and I'll do my own thing. And I don't know what it is. But, you know, fate has its way or or you are who you are your truth comes out uh, when i was traveling in europe when i was 18 um there weren't a lot of english language books available and one of the ones i put in my backpack was a copy of middlemarch which i picked up i think waterstones piccadilly or something you know before we got on the train to the continent i had no idea what it was i'm sure it had been on my dad's shelf but i had never really thought about it, it just looked like a big family saga kind of novel and had this picture of a young woman with a book on the front and i thought okay this will do and I read it on the train and I read it in that kind of enthusiastic, naive way you read something when you're young and you, you aren't expecting it to be, you don't have all that baggage people bring to the idea of a classic where you think, oh, I better take this really seriously. I think I ignored parts that now I take very seriously. And I just read it as the story of Dorothea and her life and her aspirations. And I was 18, she was 18, and I really related mm. to to her desire to figure out what to do with her life and I had a lot of those questions and you know sitting on a beach in in Greece is a good place to wonder about your future <laughs> when you're young mm. so I I was really entranced by it but I didn't again say this is going to be my this is going to be my book the book of my life you know when you're traveling you you sort of turn over books so I left it in a hostel and picked up something else and to carry on and it just had made a really good impression so I did take a 19th century fiction class, I think it was a Victorian fiction class specifically, as an undergraduate, and we read Middlemarch again. And by that time, it was pretty clear to me, this is the kind of stuff I like talking about the most. This is this is where I keep I keep coming back to this. Every time I read this kind of book, it, it draws me to it. And so that's what I ended up doing for my undergraduate honors thesis. Uh, actually, it was on Middlemarch and Thomas Carlyle's History of the French Revolution, which is sort of a maybe an unexpected <laughs> uh, juxtaposition. And by the end of that process, I was applying to graduate school and Victorian literature was the thing. And that's just kind of where I went after that. But it was mm -hmm. a process of kind of accidents along the way, a charismatic teacher, a, a, you know, the right book at the right time, not being afraid anymore of, kind of being in my, my father's shadow or whatever that mm -hmm. would be. Oh, that's, yeah. that's fun to hear. And I, I think for me, it's it's been it's been a bit of a rougher uh, go. Uh, I, mo and and let me see if I can articulate this in a way that makes sense. And I'm I'm curious if Paul's in some ways uh, similar. Um, I read a lot of these in college, and a lot I probably mean like four or five. You know that. But they it was, seemed like a lot, right? <laughs> they seemed like a lot, and I did enjoy them. I really did enjoy them. But they they weren't necessarily my my favorites. Um, and then when I left college and you know started following more publishers and just what other people were reading online as fulfilling my reading interests, I, I realized I, I will reread. You know, I'm rereading right now the Brothers Karamazov because a new translation just came out. You know, there's a there's a, a new book and it's not just a new edition. We get perennial new editions of of all of these Victorian um, novels every year, but they kind of come and go and, you know, there's another one, but a new translation, you know, this weekend, um, a lot of people are are online um, showing that they're reading Emily Wilson's new translation of the Iliad. Right. And I've, I've got that too. And it's so exciting, but there aren't new translations of, you know, David Copperfield or of uh, Middlemarch. You, and a lot of my, my favorite publishers They've probably either already published those, you know, Penguin Classics, for example. They've had those forever. And, you know, other favorite publishers aren't publishing them. And so they don't just pop up with a, 
you know, as a, as a shiny new thing. They always seemed like something I would have to work to to make plans for. And it was Paul a few years ago that made me start to realize I am I am cheating myself and neglecting an area that I actually do miss reading, you know, Victorian literature. And I, you know, if in the past I ever said, I think I've read all of the Dickens I want to read, uh, that was a, something that I learned was was silly and wrong. I, I and and then finally went out and read Great Expectations, a book I'd never had the opportunity to read before in a class, and therefore never did it. Mm-hmm. And boy, I'm so glad that I did that. And I've you know been reading uh, Anthony Trollope, who will come up on my list. But your enthusiasm, Rowan, and then Paul also kind of prodding a little bit has been what's made me think. There's so much here that I that I that I truly love. Not just that I want to have read or want to, you know, have the ability to talk about, but that have resonance with my life and with the the you know, who I am right now that I I do want to explore it more deeply. And so I've read more Victorian novels over the past couple of years than I had in the 20 years since I finished grad school. And it's been so fun. So I've been excited again for this conversation. <laughs> well, one of the things that always makes me the saddest is when people say that that they read some Victorian novels in high school or college and that ruined their interest in it, mm. you know, that they had such a miserable time of it that, that they just said never again. And I, I, that comes up all the time when, when these novels are mentioned on Twitter. There's always someone who's like, oh, I can't, you know, I can't bear it. Somebody made me read Hard Times or they made me read Great Expectations or they made me read some other some other book that I think is super fun. And I, I always think it, it's probably not just the teacher's fault, but it may be partly. And a lot of times people, in these, especially in high school, you're kind of coercing people into reading something who maybe are just not ready for it or they're just not interested in it. But also you're often not trained to, to do that kind of job. Maybe you have a curriculum, you have to enforce something like that. And it doesn't become a very good experience. But also maybe some of these books are better at a different age. I read Middlemarch in a particular way because I was very young the first time I read it. But now that I'm <clears throat> older than that, <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I really re- react very differently to it. And that's something about the book that I have come to cherish from rereading it, that it seems to be growing up with me, that mm-hmm. it didn't stay put. And then mark of a book that you can go back to over the years and, and have a new experience of it because you were maybe less like Dorothea than you liked to imagine when you were 18 and more like Mr. Kasabin than you <laughs> than you really care to admit, or maybe even more like Rosamond sometimes than you were willing to admit in your mm. youthful sort of idealism. That's something that's also really, really special. And and some of these really long novels, maybe for that digressiveness that that you mentioned, you know, is, mm. is that they, they have all those places in it for you to go imaginatively. It's not just the one neatly carved out path do you have a history also with the 19th century novel paul i do yeah i have mentioned before i grew up i think predisposed to love it because my mom was such a charles dickens fan i've mentioned she's david copperfield is her favorite novel she reads it every year and just seeing this tattered copy on our shelf on her nightstand around the house like even as a kid i think i always paid a lot of attention to what my parents were reading and even though i didn't read a lot of it myself it was like I don't know. It just always fascinated me. And so, um, yeah, I think I was predisposed in the first place, but this will warm your heart, Rowan. I had the, kind of the opposite effect or the opposite experience of what you just described for a lot of your students. I, in high school, I had a very similar where I would be assigned things and I would kind of read the Cliff's notes and kind of fudge my way through it and everything. Right. But something happened when I got to college. Part of it I can definitely attribute to, I don't know if you had a chance to listen to our Jane Austen episode, but uh, Dr. Ray, who was my Jane Austen professor, her enthusiasm and passion for Jane Austen in particular, but for a lot of these books was one of the real turning points for me. And it shows the power of what you just described. If a teacher is the right fit for you, it can just transform your view of not only one author or one book, but she just made classics for me exciting and opened up all these possibilities. So I would give a lot of the, the credit to her, even though most of it was Jane Austen. It wasn't necessarily Victorian, but several of the but other she books. She really modeled somebody who just found reading this 
fun and exciting and, exactly. and stimulating. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of what you were describing, like the undercurrents, there is a sexiness. There is these social things that you didn't know about that add another layer of richness to it. And so I think for me, that was definitely a turning point. So for me, college was a launching point for going back and not going back, but discovering all of these books and, and kind of viewing them in that light. And so, like I said, there's several that I'll mention today, but, you know, Wuthering Heights and and a lot of other ones that I read in college, it was actually a wonderful experience that I think fuels my enthusiasm yeah. to this oh, day. That's so, so great. Yeah. I mean, I think that, um, that that is something that a teacher can and should try to do. I mean, you want your students to take the work seriously, but you want them to see that that's not antithetical to really enjoying it. In fact, analysis can make it more exciting. You know, that the the book can start to kind of hum with significance, and oh, yeah. and some of mm-hmm. you know, like Dickens, who gives you just so much to laugh at and so much to cry over too. And I, mm-hmm. I just the idea of a classroom where that's not part of the discussion is is really a shame. But I'm also really interested in what you say about your parents too, because I think you know, it was the same for me. I, I knew my parents read a lot. I looked at what they read and, and to me, part of being grown up was having these interests and in all these different, my mother is an avid reader of, of Virginia Woolf. She read all her diaries, all her letters. I always saw her reading this kind of stuff. And that sense that reading can be something kind of aspirational, you know, that you would re- reach for the, what you think of as like the adult stuff. Mm-hmm. I sometimes feel like right now we've, we've seen a kind of switch in that. There's so many adults who talk all the time about their favorite young adult books that, right. that the young people, they don't maybe, they're not and this is I'm not trying to be judgmental about this, it's just different that they that they don't maybe aspire to read the harder stuff, you know, or they don't think of it as something mm. that that's that's a goal for them. I, I want to be the kind of person who who reads War and Peace. I want to be the kind of person who's really into Jane Austen. Um, they're happy with their Harry Potter, Twilight, whatever the latest, um, because they see their adults are also really enthusiastic about that. Mm-hmm. And I just I think about the difference that makes sometimes. On the other hand, Harry Potter, made a generation of students really uh, unafraid of long books, right? I mean, they're not as long as David Mm. Copperfield, but they're, you know, they're pretty sizable and they were, you know, young people were just devouring them. Mm. So we used to be able to carry a lot of that enthusiasm. I think we're now a generation or so after the first Harry Potter generation of students. Right. But I think it made a difference to their, to their readiness, their, their, to believe that a long book would be fun. Mm. They were, they were already reading them and uh, and they could hang in there. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and I, I won't, we don't have to go mm-hmm. on to an adaptations um, sidetrack here, but I will just say that I think also like the Christmas Carol in particular, like my parents would watch three or four different versions of that, you know, each year. And so even though they're not all, you know, sticking to the book or, you know, there, there's different ways to go about it. I think for me, that also built a fascination of just in that particular book, like the the dark, you know, foggy tunnels and the the soot in London and just kind of the spooky, but also, I don't know, just a whole different lifestyle. The bookkeepers like shuffling along with candles right. and just all that, I think for me, just created kind of like a mystery and a magic that Definitely. for my young mind, I think kind of gave me a soft spot for this era too. Yeah. Oh, uh, so we do have, we each picked uh, three authors, three, I don't know if, if it was three books or three authors. I did pick uh, three authors and one book to kind of be emblematic of what I was going for um, with it. And we can go through that. We often just do kind of one at a time, but we don't have to be that way. If, if you want to kind of go over, if, if some of them relate to uh, one another, uh, feel free to go. But Rowan, why don't we start with uh, with yours, you know, however you want to approach it and, and ha- continue our conversation about I think what what Victorian is Victorian literature is to us, and as well as some of our our best experiences with it. Yeah, I thought about uh, about that a lot while I was trying to decide what what kind of exemplary text to bring along, and I did uh-huh. stick to that kind of mid Victorian idea because that was our official topic. And I was trying to think about what would best capture that sense of what it is that still satisfies me about this particular work. You know, sometimes I'll look around at my colleagues and I think you could learn a lot about our characters by what we specialize in. <laughs> you know, so there must be something Victorian about me that, that that's what I do. You know, the 18th century people are kind of wry and cynical and the Shakespearean people are more theatrical. I don't know. Um, so, the, you know, as the, I'm, I'm the one, I'm the resident Victorianist. I'm the only one now in the department. And, and I think what I bring to that is, is some of the stereotypical qualities that people associate with the Victorian era. But for some people, it's criticism and for me they're things that I actually 
I guess I wouldn't necessarily endorse them 100%, but like earnestness, you know, like a sense of social responsibility, like the sense that mm. there can genuinely be a, a, a conflict between duty and desire, you know, that love isn't everything, that there are other things that matter. And I really appreciate the way that the Victorian novelists that I love commit themselves to these as things you really have to think about and work uh, work on as a person and as a reader and as a writer, that these are books that are really about your moral character. And I know that that's what's off-putting for some people about this. They want to kind of get to something that's more aesthetic mm -hmm. or often on Twitter, people will be raving about, you know, the sentences in a particular book. And I'm like, yeah, sentences, but what about the heart? Where's the heart? Where's the passion? You know, <laughs> where's the change your life kind of... So, so I went all in on books that have that kind of quality. And part of that is because, you know, I think, what would it mean not to take some of the issues that they bring up seriously, you know, not to be earnest about them? I don't think that's the world I want to live in. So my first example, because we did say literature and not fiction, um, is Elizabeth Barrett Browning's Aurora Lee. And I, I picked that uh, for partly because it is a, a long poem. And that's another interesting phenomenon of the period, these long narrative poems. I don't know if either of you has encountered Aurora Lee in any kind of detail no if not not me right. yeah I don't think no. so I was trying to remember it we might have it might have come up in class but sad to say I don't remember yeah it wasn't really um I had the good fortune of being taught in the 90s by someone who was a bit of an, a Barrett Browning specialist and I don't think I would have encountered Aurora Lee that relatively early in my own career if it weren't for that because it really is a not an often encountered text except in small excerpts so what i love about aurora lee first of all is the absolute fearlessness of it so a lot of the talk about women writers in particular in the period has to do with the the pressures on them and the prohibitions and the inhibitions you know maybe seeking out a male pseudonym to protect yourself from judgment or the sense that women's lives were curtailed and and oppressed in these various legal and economic ways so there's a lot of hardship narrative um, rightly so of course but of course women actually lived in all kinds of different ways and and reacted to that in so many different ways and um, Elizabeth Barrett Browning was the sort of most confrontational in a way of the writers that I that I teach about this she just basically said I don't care what you think I'm going to do what I want and she did this as a poet she wrote this remarkable text that is a an epic novel in verse or a you know she called it a verse novel so it's a it's a full-fledged novel with characters and plots it's got a love story it's it's got uh, subplots and sub characters um, but it's in blank verse it has epic wow. similes it has the whole shebang so it's 400 pages of iambic pentameter right? <laughs> which is a big ask it's an epic poet about a female poet right so it takes all the epic conventions and it says guess who's worthy of epic treatment basically me right a, a woman poet uh, it takes on all the the patriarchal hostility to women early on in the novel aurora is proposed to by her condescending cousin romney who says you know women can't be poets calm down and come be my wife and she says no absolutely not she says i too have my vocation work to do and she turns down his proposal goes off to become a poet and uh, she has various challenges along the way but part of what the result is is this poem that we're reading this autobiographical poem and uh it it is as i said it, it's fearless it's about her desires it has some very uh, erotic sections in it it has some a whole subplot involving what the Victorians called a fallen woman. And Barrett Browning, after the poet came, a poem came out, she said, you know, a lot of people are really upset at my talking about this. And it was about a, it's actually about a, a working class woman who's basically kind of sold into prostitution and ends up getting pregnant. So there's no mystery about what's happened to her. You know, the, the baby is a signal that yes, people had sex with her, that she didn't want having sex with her. So there's, the plot is about as explicit as you can make it. And uh, EBB said, you know, people think I shouldn't talk about this, but if women don't talk about this, we might as well be dumb and die, she said. Those are her words. Wow. So she wasn't afraid to, to talk about that. And she wasn't afraid to have her character Aurora befriend this woman. And this idea was that nice women didn't have anything to do with fallen women because they would pick up this contagion, you know, like like there's always the risk with little Emily and David Copperfield, you know, that, that it's so shocking to, to reach out. And Aurora reaches out her hand and says, come with me, sweetest sister, and takes, takes the fallen woman by the hand and takes her into her home and, 
So it's it's got all these really socially radical ideas, and it's totally committed to the idea that poetry should change the world, that it's a, a kind of expression of the need to combine the spiritual and the material world. So it's it's really exciting. But it is 400 pages of blank verse, and not all of it is as exciting as other parts of it. So, <laughs> you know, it can be a stretch. But it exemplifies some qualities that I think are really um, special about about Victorian literature, the sense that one thing you can do with your poetry, with your fiction, is just get in people's faces mm. and show them what's possible and not settle for compromises. So she, she says that our age, people say it's prosaic. I say the opposite. It's as exciting as any heroic age. We should be unscrupulously epic. And it has the only epic simile to do with breastfeeding that I'm familiar with. Too. <laughs> That's my pitch for Aurora Lee. <laughs> wow. You sold me. That sounds great. I wish I could read it in your class, though. That's what I like. Some texts like that. That's what I miss about college is mm. it does sound intimidating to read by yourself. But if you could do it in the right yeah. environment, it sounds like it could just be so rich and layered. Yeah, I mean, that's how I feel about, I don't know, Ulysses, you know, that I'll never be equipped to read it by myself. But if I had an enthusiastic person, I could take them, take them through it. Mm. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm only assigning excerpts from it this coming uh, term, which I feel kind of unhappy about because you miss that sense of, again of just how daring a, uh, an undertaking it really is to just mm. put it all out there mm. in this in this long verse novel form she just rejects oppositions all the way through it you know that i can be a woman and a poet i can write a poem and a novel i can be good and i can be sexy i can be all these things and you know basically you'll just great. have to take it yeah well paul normally i would say paul what do you have but do, do you happen to have a, a poet I on do your... not. Okay, I then maybe not. maybe it makes sense for me to jump on. I didn't okay. either until Rowan sent the uh, EBB as one of her author authors, you know, to us as the initials, and I thought she's doing a poet. Mm-hmm. I didn't even think about doing a, a, a poet, and we haven't, re- you know, until you brought that up. You know, nothing that we talked about in you know, what is the Victorian novel and whatnot brought up the the poets and so i did step back and think okay one of my favorite reading experiences when i was in college when i was an undergrad was reading alfred lord tennyson's 1850 poem in memoriam ahh oh, yes i i remember it being assigned and thinking okay i'm excited you know i i did i did always enjoy my my reading assignments and going into it but this was possibly one of the first poems of that size and of this kind of uh, uh, period, for sure, that just really took me on a journey. I loved every minute of it from the start until the end. Um, And I don't remember it all particularly well, Uh, but it was, you know, it was an evening I think I read it all in in a couple of days, but in particular in the evenings. And it was definitely in the, probably like November, (laughs) just a great setting for a poem about grief and loss. And then trying to figure out what does that mean in all, you know, kind of other, in, in some other areas of my life where I, where I try to, where I've learned lessons about how to deal with grief and loss. But right now, I don't know if they're working for me. Um, when I think about religion, when I think about spirituality, it was easier to grapple with all of that when I didn't have, you know, uh, something, someone that I was grieving at that moment. And um, is there a way to get on the other side of that? And is there a way to um, to come out with hope? Or is it, you know, because he, he's, I, I loved the grapple. You talked about, the the grappling with these issues and and kind of in a in an in your face not not like a beating you but just like a, I'm gonna say it you know I'm not gonna be cutesy um, mm-hmm. even though this is a poem that rhymes yeah, quite well <laughs> yeah. um, it it flows so well as he explores um, you know religion and and faith and loss and grief and and the passage of time in general you know just as as you know the the a new year you know uh even in 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 my church growing up we would have the the new year's hymns and one of them was you know ring out wild bells the, taking passages from tennyson and i didn't know that until i read the passage in the in the play or in the poem and i'm like whoa 
we I've sung I've sung this poem before, <laughs> at least that part of it, and just I I loved it, and you know it was really nice. I'm glad you opened the door to to poetry, uh, because that helped me start to remember more my relationship with this time period and and some of the other things that I just loved about it. I I have read the poem since, but it's been some time, and I don't. I, I've read other Tennyson poems, you know, Charge of the Light Brigade and The Lady of Shalott, you know, plenty of them. But, and and while I may may like them, or you, is it, does he call it Ulysses? What's the one on? There, yeah, the, he has a dramatic monologue called yeah, Ulysses. Yeah. Yeah. And so I read those, you know, as they were assigned to me, but I've never gone back to any of them. They didn't, they didn't strike me either. But this poem, again, kind of became a part of, of me. Yeah. Um, oh, it's at that an time. extraordinary poem I'm, I'm so glad you brought it up yeah you know one of the things I knew about it before I myself had had any sort of profound experience of grief was that after George Eliot's husband had died one thing she spent a lot of time doing was mm. reading in memoriam Queen Victoria famously read in memoriam after Albert died it, it sounds like a kind of a cliche you know, oh it's a poem about mourning people who are sad read it and then if you are thrown into a really intense grief um, I was surprised myself by how much I wanted poetry <laughs> I'm still mm. surprised by that because there's something about the the feelings being put into the right words or, or being put into words that could maybe be right, you know, and, and feeling that, that uh, echo or something that resonance, right. With, with your feeling it. And it is a poem. You're right. It goes through these, these cycles and he, he does come out the other side with his faith mm -hmm. kind of intact, but there's that famous section right in the middle about nature red and tooth and claw where he's in doubt because he's looking at the world and it doesn't seem to him to correspond to any vision of divine grace or, or mercy. And, and that, doubt in the center it gives it so much tension but some of those lines they i i hear them in my head almost every day you know he he is not here but far away the noise of life begins again you know you just yeah hmm. and tennyson is often thought of as such a flowery poet but i mean in memoriam is not i mean lady of shalott is what people mostly know i think you know the kind mm -hmm. of medievalism and the the kind of embroidery and pre-raphaelite right. pictures you know and words mm -hmm. but, but there's something quite austere about parts of In Memoriam. Mm -hmm. Have you read it, Paul? I was trying to remember. I I, I think I have, but there's there's going to be, this might be a repeating theme for me. There's, I think I need to go back and revisit some of the non-headliners, you know, like the ones, mm -hmm. I mean, not that Tennyson's not a headliner, but you know what I mean? I need to start digging back through my Norton anthologies and kind of <laughs> exploring some of those again. I don't remember if I have or not, to be honest with you. I know I read, like Lady of Shalott for sure, like you said, Charge of the Light Brigade. I remember mm -hmm. this one. I I would imagine we probably touched on it, but hearing you both talk about it makes me really want to go back and check it out for sure. Yeah. It's such a simple verse form. I, I think it's just mm -hmm. called the in, an in memoriam stanza because it doesn't follow any existing huh. pre existing pattern. But they're, mm -hmm. they're short lines. It, they're rhyming, like you say. They have a real simplicity to the structure, but but it certainly does take you on a journey. Well, there's some just gems in the poetry from the period. I don't know if either of you read Christina Rossetti's Goblin Market at some point. We mm, did read but that. That one. also mm -hmm. tends to really surprise people. <laughs> it's, it's just wild. It is wild. Yeah. Well, well, I knew I could count on the two of you to get into, you know, some other areas because I feel like my choices are all fairly basic. And so I'm glad that you both, um, you know, are, are exploring <laughs> some other areas too. That was um, my that was my my biggest deep dive. Yeah, I, I, Alfred Lord Tennyson, Paul. Have you heard of him? Right. No, <laughs> I never heard of him. Yeah. Well, compared to my three, he's pretty obscure because um, I did not. I'm not going to surprise anybody, but I'm actually going to switch up the order a little bit to tie into Rowan's discussion about the fallen woman. <clears throat> and the first one I'm going to mention is Tess of the D'Urbervilles by Thomas Hardy. Um, this was another one that I came across in college, and it was actually for kind of our, as English majors, we had like a final exam where it would pull all these, it was probably like eight or 10 different texts, and it was just modern. Some of them were, you know, it was like Angels in America, you know, the the play, and, and Tess of the D'Urbervilles was one of them, and then we'd have to make all these connections. And I, of course, being the nerd that I am, absolutely loved it. And Tess in particular, like my copy is just covered in notes which i would probably cringe to read most of them today you know irony or foreshadowing or something like that but um That's pretty much what my notes usually say so yeah <laughs> okay that makes me feel better yeah but um it was just one of those courses along with jane austen and the odyssey you know that just really did 
change my life. And, and this book was just so wonderful. So for those who don't know, it's the story of a young girl growing up in this rural area and it's right on the edge of modernization. So there's lots of hints of machinery and, you know, smoke in this pastoral landscape, which ties into a lot of the other themes um, about she is a, a young, innocent girl. And, and there's these basically, you know, this, there's a predator, a male predator who's on the loose in, in the area. And there's all kinds of, you know, it's not necessarily subtle, but there's lots of pastoral scenes of, of sheep and, you know, these beautiful landscapes. But then, like I said, there's the machinery coming in and, and that definitely ties into this whole idea of innocent Tess, you know, being kind of stalked by Angel, who is the uh, the name of the guy. And, but what I like about this, uh, I mean, I like a lot of things about it, but the stance that it takes towards Tess and the whole idea of a fallen woman, I feel like, I mean, Rowan, you can maybe add some depth here, but I feel like it's pretty progressive for the time. Even the book's subtitle is called A Pure Woman Faithfully Presented. Yeah, and I was so, just about to say that. Yeah, yeah. That, that's a kind of an in-your-face moment like we were talking about. Right. So I challenge you to to argue with me about this. Right, exactly. Yeah. Because, I mean, I won't, you know, I don't know that there's really a spoiler, but I mean, over the course of the novel, she does succumb to the seduction of Angel and she ends up, you know, a fallen woman of the time. But it's just, it doesn't feel like we are alongside her for much of the novel there's not the judgment, but there is the tragedy. So it it is high drama, very emotional, like a lot of of drama and tragedy from beginning to end. Um, but anybody who knows Thomas Hardy knows this is not going to be a feel good read. It's not you're not going to come out of the other side like, you know, feeling happy and optimistic. But um, I was thinking about it when I read this book. You know, I was a big fan of the Cure, the British, you know, the goth, the dreary goth band and i was like no wonder i liked this it's like right in that wheelhouse of just the the very emotional you know melodramatic but so good and i just thought i would read this this passage because i think it's just beautiful but it also will give people a little bit of some people may roll their eyes but for me this is what i love about it it says day at length broke in the sky when it had been day aloft for some little while it became day in the wood Directly the assuring and prosaic light of the world's active hours had grown strong. She crept from under her hillock of leaves and looked around boldly. Then she perceived what had been going on to disturb her. The plantation wherein she had taken shelter ran down at this spot into a peak which ended it hitherward, outside the hedge being arable ground. Under the trees several pheasants lay about, their rich plumage dabbled with blood. Some were dead, some feebly twitching a wing, some staring up at the sky some pulsating quickly, some contorted, some stretched out, all of them writhing in agony, except the fortunate ones whose tortures had ended during the night by the inability of nature to bear more. Tess guessed at once the meaning of this. The birds had been driven down into this corner the day before by some shooting party, and while those that had dropped dead under the shot or had died before nightfall had been searched for and carried off, many badly wounded birds had escaped and hidden themselves away, or risen among the thick boughs where they had maintained their position, till they grew weaker with loss of blood in the nighttime when they had fallen one by one as she had heard them. And I just, I, for one thing, I just love the language. I think it's beautiful, yeah. but clearly there's so many connections to her. She at this point is kind of, you know, just struggling to find a place. She has been, you know, compromised by the standards of the society. She is the wounded bird, you know, who is running away from these hunters basically. And there's even a part where it talks about, Oh, it's right here, actually. She had occasionally caught glimpses of these men in girlhood looking over hedges or peeping through bushes and pointing their guns, strangely accutered, a bloodthirsty light in their eyes. That part comes right after that. And it's just so clearly like, you know, this idea of men peeping through bushes and their guns pointed at you and just this male aggression and and her perspective of just being chased and harried and wounded that I just found so beautiful and tragic and wonderful. But again, it's not... I mean, she is a victim, but there is a lot of strength in Tess that I really admire. And I think for the time, it was a very progressive approach to this idea of a fallen woman. So, yeah. Do you have yeah. anything you'd add to that? Yeah, I just I, I agree that I mean, Hardy, can, I think, can be a really awkward stylist sometimes. But when he mm. gets in his when he kind of gets in the groove and especially mm -hmm. when he's writing about nature, he just does such a beautiful, beautiful job at, at summoning it up. And I love what you said about it reflecting Tess, like just the sense that 
that yes, it, it's natural, but it's also symbolic, but it doesn't feel artificially so. It just feels like she's part of this world and that, that the strictures and the condemnation that, that's persecuting her, the, the sort of predatory men, you know, the, the, the hunters, or, or even just the whole world that won't let her come back and be at home, even though in her heart she is morally innocent. You know, she mm-hmm. hasn't herself done anything wrong. Um, and her fortitude in the face of that. She is a kind of a, like it's a kind of a passive strength. She doesn't really fight back against it. Right. Um, she endures more than anything else, but that she's constantly driven to further and further away from any kind of hope. It really is a, a painful process. Yeah, uh, it's, it's a devastating, devastating novel. And, mm-hmm. and I agree. I, could, I don't know if I would maybe go with progressive. I guess I would go with like, again, scathing. It's such a condemnation of mm. the world as Hardy understood it and the way that sexual morality is defined in such impossible ways and in such a double standard, you know, that women pay the, the price always and, and, and that there's no nuance there's no subtlety there's you know she, she's part of nature she, she she is sexual and and i think she's depicted as being quite sensual and mm-hmm. but in this kind of innocent innocent way yeah it's really a i mean he gave up writing novels right after jude the obscure as he'd had enough of trying to reframe and rewrite so that he could actually publish what he wanted to say mm-hmm. and um sometimes that's another little way I set up those artificial boundaries, right? Scott gave up uh, poetry for fiction at the early end, and then Hardy gives up fiction for poetry at the other end. And right. you feel like in, in some respects, the things that they were hoping the novel could do had been done by, you know, by that point. And then the novel goes in a whole new direction after that. Mm. Um, that's but, interesting. Yeah, wow. That's I will say uh, on my week weekend, you know, what are you reading? People are still reading Thomas Hardy quite heavily. Uh, mm-hmm. His his stuff comes up all the time, and not just Tess or Jude the Obscure. It's like, you know, a bunch of the other ones. People are people are still at least at least people who respond to that particular post are yeah. are still reading Thomas Hardy, and I think that's pretty yeah. cool. Well, I mean, There's I a think new, uh, novel too by Elizabeth Lowry called The Chosen, which is about Hardy and his mm. wife. If if that's something you're interested, in. I thought it was. I thought it was pretty good. You know, I didn't yeah, love yeah. it, but I didn't, I didn't know about evocative. that. I'll just say, I mean, I don't know if this is the reason that people are drawn to Thomas Hardy, but if there are those stereotypes about the prim and proper and the, you know, the button down, I mean, it's still existing in that same society, but as far as just there, there is the, the wildness and the, and the just looking in the face of some of this really dark stuff mm-hmm. that, I don't know if that's maybe some of the appeal why people still stick with it, but yeah, I, I love him. I actually have read only several of his books, but I still have a lot to go. And I, every time I talk about him, I'm like, why am I not reading more? <laughs> well, maybe because, you know, it's not exactly fun, you know, yeah, it's, I think... it's rewarding, but it's a little bit of a downer. It's true. <laughs> that's probably a lot of it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I usually, I, I'm not a huge hearty reader. I've read four or five and the ones I teach are only Tess and Jude. And I, I know Jude especially well. And it is, I always warn my students, you know, you think it's bad now, it's going to get worse. Like every time you think he's hit a new low, there's another low below that in terms of just how devastated you're going to feel. So just brace yourself. And right. and that really is the ultimate indictment, isn't it? You know, that this, the propriety that people associate with Victorianism. I mean, they were fighting back against it in the in the moment. It was always in flux the way, the way it is now, mm-hmm. you know, too, with, with social norms always contested. So, yeah. Well, let's go on to your next one, Rowan. And... So my next, my next nominee um, is, I, I think I chose all three texts that I've come to appreciate more, maybe not the ones that were my mm-hmm. first loves when I was reading Victorian literature. So the one I've brought with me for this next one is Elizabeth Gaskell's Mary Barton. And Gaskell is not an obscure choice, I think, for people who like Victorian literature. She's, she's kind of a, a, a pretty well-known second second tier you know she's not as famous as george Eliot and the brontes and dickens but she's maybe as well known as trollope for instance it's it's my experience and i think it would probably not be disputed by anybody that her novel north and south her later novel is a better novel than mary barton which was her first um and i love north and south and i agree it's a better novel but i i really i really have come to appreciate mary barton partly for its very quality of artlessness. I mean, it is an artful novel in a way, but it's not it's not as carefully crafted or as balanced um, as as North and South. Or she's really beloved also for her comic novel Cranford and her unfinished final novel Wives and Daughters. But Mary Barton is a kind of put all your cards on the table novel, and it is a novel about class conflict. Um, 
she was a minister's wife working in Manchester in the in the 40s, the 1840s, and she was seeing a lot of poverty. She was seeing a lot of the negative consequences of rapid industrialization and rapid urbanization. So people were living in these really harsh conditions and they were being really exploited by the factory owners and really, you know, they were breathing in fluff in the cotton mills that were that was choking up their lungs. They were getting their limbs caught in exposed machinery. I mean, it was really tough, uh, tough situations. And what she saw was rising tension between the the sort of well-to-do and and the not so well-to-do and this is in the shadow really of you know, the French Revolution it wasn't that long ago it was still in people's minds there were revolutions breaking out on the continent and people at home were really worried that they had a kind of powder keg domestically too and so there was a lot of anxiety about how to keep calm and keep people from you know keep a kind of conflagration from from bursting out and in the preface that she wrote to the novel, she, she said that she looked around Manchester and uh, she said, I saw that, that the, the poor, the working people were sore and irritable against the rich. And the more I reflected on this unhappy state of things between those so bound to each other by common interests as the employers and the employed must ever be, the more anxious I became to give some utterance to the agony which from time to time convulses this dumb people, that is, you know, people who can't speak mm. for themselves, not stupid people, the agony of suffering without the sympathy of the happy or of erroneously believing that such is the case. So she really felt that, that this kind of suffering maybe could be ameliorated by by giving it a voice and especially by, you know, she didn't expect maybe working people necessarily to, to be the ones who would read Mary Barton. But if people who had more power and political influence and money read it, they would maybe look differently at the situation and it wouldn't be so antagonistic. So it's a very conciliatory instinct. She was a, as a minister's wife, she, she had an idea of, of her kind of Christian duty that was not necessarily about social upheaval, but more about, again, trying to get people to recognize each other as sharing in their common common suffering. And, and if you'll indulge me to read a little bit, um, it anticipates a lot of journalism we have now, where the idea is you, you put a human face on the problem, and that maybe helps to change people's minds. So if you're in your carriage and you're riding down the street, you don't see how people are living. Uh, so she has one scene where her main characters, um, John Barton and one of his other factory buddies, are going to help out uh, one of their fellow workers who's fallen on hard times. And we follow them along the street, and then they go down the stairs and down again into the cellar apartment where this family, where this family lives. Um, so be, the passage begins, Our friends were not dainty, but even they picked their way till they got to some steps leading down to a small area where a person standing would have his head about one foot below the level of the street, and might at the same time without the least motion of his body touch the window of the cellar and the damp, muddy wall right opposite. You went down one step even further from the foul area into the cellar in which a family of human beings lived. And you can feel that, that you're supposed to be outraged, right? That your you know, pigs would, would not be happy here. It was very dark inside. The window panes, many of them were broken and stuffed with rags, which was reason enough for the dusky light that pervaded the place even at midday. After the account I have given of the state of the street, no one can be surprised that on going into the cellar, the smell was so fetid as almost to knock the two men down. Quickly recovering themselves, as those inured to such things do, they began to penetrate the thick darkness of the place and to see three or four little children rolling on the damp, nay, wet brick floor through which the stagnant, filthy moisture of the street oozed up. The fireplace was empty and black. The wife sat on her husband's lair and cried in the dark loneliness. So it's just a devastating picture of poverty and and hopelessness and hunger and despair and the working people visiting they don't have much money right they don't really have much to do but they do everything they possibly can to round up some food and some support for this starving man and john barton goes out into the street on his way to try to get some help and as he walks along he passes all the brightly lit shops you know, lit up for the holiday with all the food and the well-to-do people coming and going and buying gifts and uh, the narrator comments, he felt the contrast between the well-filled, well-lighted shops and the dim, gloomy cellar, and it made him moody that such contrast should exist. 
Barton's was an errand of mercy, but the thoughts of his heart were touched by sin, by bitter hatred of the happy, which he for the time confounded with the selfish. So, you know, you can see it's it's not subtle. It's not a it's not it's not trying to ask you to really think through the nuances of economic, you know, or trade or but it's pointing out what happens and you live with that kind of suffering and you see other people are not suffering and you don't understand why, right? And it doesn't seem just, it doesn't seem right. You may lash out and that's the fear. And so she adds in a, a strike, which brings a lot of conflict, including acid being thrown on, on workers. She brings in a murder plot, uh, which brings the, the political or economic conflict into this dramatic plot there's a boat chase there's a trial i know boat chase maybe not as thrilling as a car chase but it's pretty exciting <laughs> at the moment <laughs> yeah and finally it brings uh two fathers together at the end one who has lost his son and the other who is responsible for that and and puts them together in a situation where they have to try to learn that the class difference between them is not everything so the narrator, again, not subtle, absolutely playing for pathos, right? Um, the eyes of John Barton grew dim with tears. Rich and poor, masters and men, were then brothers in the deep suffering of the heart. The mourner before him was no longer the employer, a being of another race, eternally placed in antagonistic attitude, going through the world, glittering like gold with a stony heart within, which knew no sorrow but through the accidents of trade, no longer the enemy, the oppressor, but a poor and desolate old man. And that's really the whole point of the book. The, a lot of the beginning starts with trying to show poor people as like human beings with families and pride, and that's to teach your middle-class readers to humanize the people that they don't take seriously, and then the other way is to get the, the working-class people to recognize the humanity of the rich. And it seems maybe simple-minded even, but it actually has a very powerful emotional effect. And I'm a sucker for that. You know, the, the father, the dead son, the the remorse, the inability to undo mm. the harm that you've done, you know, and that mm. you thought you were fighting for a cause, but you've, you've now you've destroyed something that you can't rebuild. So, and again, there's a love story. And then they emigrate to Canada at the end, some of them, and like, hey, nice. Canada. <laughs> so Wow, so that I, sounds I think, amazing. Um, it really is a good example of, of the social problem fiction. And it has all the things that people who don't like that whole Victorianism won't like. <laughs> it is sentimental. It is melodramatic. It is desperately earnest. And I love it. So. <laughs> I love that you own it. No, that, I was just going to say for how, <laughs> for how like, you know, preachy or whatever you want to say, it sounds like it was about the topics as you were talking about it, I'm like, well, all of those same things are in the headlines right now. Like every single day there's mm -hmm. strikes and there's the 1% versus the rest, you know? And so it's like, yes, it was preachy, but like, wow, we still got yeah. the same problem. So. Yeah. And also the, you know, famously, you know, Engels was writing the condition of the working class in England while based in Manchester, you know, he was looking at the same problem and he and Marx would come to slightly different conclusions about the best solution, right? Mm. Uh, um, or at least the inevitable results. So she's anticipating class warfare. She doesn't have that vocabulary for it exactly, but that's what she's seeing. And she's hoping that everyone can just get along and, and that true Christianity for her is, is about compassion and, and charity. It's not about separation and division and judgment and that's what she's trying to trying to preach through through the novel but you're right i mean the the gap between rich and poor is so extraordinary today um and i think you know that's why you see a writer like barbara kingsolver rewriting david copperfield and finding mm. more material than she needs to to show that we haven't reached some hmm. peaceful reconciliation oh for sure wow well, mine's a different kind of mood. <laughs> and I'm sitting here like, huh, how can I tie it together? Um, and maybe we don't need to at all. Well, variety is part of what makes it fun, right? <laughs> what, right. And and so, while some of this stuff is certainly in, um, I, I'm going to go with Anthony Trollope. And in particular with The Last Chronicle of Barset, um, as I've been saying on, on the podcast, I encountered The Warden a few years ago absolutely loved it and then this year uh well i read the the uh barchester towers um after that and then this year i finished off the, the six books of the chronicles of barset and this is the last one the last chronicle of barset uh and oh i just i just loved these books i loved every moment of them um and 
it does sh- to me show how well these novelists do explore the society in which these people live and their their different situations their different expectations for themselves and for others and how you know uh income and uh gentility can can play a role in how they see each other and how they see themselves um but also just the way that the these uh their relationships with their neighbors <laughs> can shape a life and they have their professions they take out loans they have marriages they are trying to deal with inheritance and the passage of time and uh religion you know church meetings and one of my favorite passages of all of them is in Barchester Towers where he's just like isn't it sad in nowhere else will they they put you in a building until you have to sit there and listen to this preacher talk for an hour <laughs> <You know? laughs> just so he he approaches so many of these things with that very light um touch that is compassionate and and uh forgiving uh, even his worst characters there are still moments where i feel deeply for them you know he'll he'll take a step back on almost all of them and go into their pains and their um personal you know their, their reasons for for uh maybe behaving the way that they are that don't come from a place of malice they genuinely are you know in some in in, in many instances actually in his books but in uh, particularly in a few that i'm thinking of they, they really are trying to do what they think is is right for other people and he has a way of of making them um making you sympathize with them, even though I disagree with their methods and how they view things completely. Uh, and this this last book was so fun because so many of the characters that we get to know in the others kind of come back together. I mean, it's got its own unique story of a, a man who has been accused of stealing a note, you know, some money um, that was meant for, for, for somewhere else. And he is very proud. He is very poor. And he's a uh, he, you know he he runs he, he he runs part of the church um in Hogglestock. This is a uh, uh, Mr. Crawley, and he he won't do the things that people tell him to do to try to make it right because he just didn't do it, and he also doesn't want to play the games. He doesn't want to hire an attorney. Um, you know, attorneys just can be tricky, and he want you know he just didn't do anything wrong. Why would he need to hire an attorney to defend him when he didn't do anything wrong? And then he starts to wonder, well, or or did I? You know, I don't really remember. I don't rem- I don't know what's going on anymore. And it's just so it it's so well done, and I loved every minute. I was very sad when it was done, and I think that these books, you know, some of the best experiences I've had are ones where I I feel like I've almost lived in this community, and and it's a part of my life. And not just some books that I read. I mean, right now they're they're memories that that uh they just feel real. They feel like people that I've known, and I love it. And a oh. lot of that is, um, I think, the narrator. Right, he's kind of got this camaraderie. He's like, "Oh, let me take your arm and and go through this sort of landscape together," and you just feel that kind of that kind of connection. All right, now I am gonna play a little bit out of turn again here and uh, bring up my third choice. We had a a bit just for listener's sake, we had a little bit of technical difficulty. So we may be lost the the train of thought on Trollope and that's totally fine. I've talked plenty about him, um, but I do want to bring up my third one that I'm going to step away and kind of uh, appreciate uh, what Paul and Rowan go over as their last part of the episode uh, as I'm doing the editing, I'm very excited for that opportunity. <laughs> um, but my my last pick is uh, one that may, maybe I stole the author from you, Rowan, or you you had said, "Hey, I'm thinking of changing." And I said, "Well, if you do, I'll take I'll take WC." Mm-hmm. Was it Wilkie Collins? It was. Oh, oh okay, good. good. <laughs> um, so I I chose the woman in white, and I did it because it's just another one of those delightful experiences. And as I mentioned before, going back and rethinking who, you know, what Victorian novels have I read? um, I loved all of them for the most part. I did read North and South, and that was probably the one that, while I really enjoyed it, maybe liked the least. And so that I have a very high bar for what I, what I read and enjoyed. And 
the the woman in white was one that I read when I was first uh, moving over to to England for a semester. Uh, I was a graduate student, and my my teacher um, asked, you know, hey, I'm I, I teach in London next term. Would anyone like to be my my teaching assistant? And before she even finished the sentence, I was you know uh, making plans and told her it needed to be me. Uh, no one else could do the job as well. You know, <laughs> just really trying to push it, and I got to go. And one of the classes that that she was teaching that I was able to help out with was a. Uh, like a mystery novels course. And we started that course out with Charles Dickens, our mutual friend, which she hadn't read yet, but knew it was kind of had a, had a bit of a mystery element at one, you know, you know, on that big book, it was a minor point of of it. But, and so I read that one um, before I went over to, to England and really did enjoy that. And then while we were there and my parents took me over and while we were there driving, you know, kind of touring a little bit before they left, I read The Woman in White, you know, on the road, in the hotel rooms, you know, as, as, as I was preparing for it. And what an exciting uh, mystery story. I, I really enjoyed it. I will say one of the disappointing things about my stay in London was that that was also the year that Andrew Lloyd Webber's musical adaptation of The Woman in White came out on stage. And he had, you know, it was, a, it was kind of a big deal. Here's, here's a, you know, a new Andrew Lloyd Webber, um, uh, musical. And I, who is the main, who played the phantom, like the big, the big one. I can't remember the name right now, but he was, he was in it. Michael Crawford, maybe. Anyway, he mm-hmm. was performing in it. Um, the, uh, it, it just, you know, it was a big deal. And I, hated it so much. And, and I, I don't even know if either of you knew that even existed. Uh, and Lloyd Webber musical about the woman in white. I knew uh, it existed, but I have avoided <laughs> any exposure to it. Very well done. Wisely, it sounds like. Well, yes, because this is something that I found very frustrating is I, I loved the story. I love that it's dealing with, again, law and inheritance and how that shapes our relationships and not just that, but how we view people, these, these societal constructs um, about people's rights and about people's, um, you know, abilities to progress or to move through society. And they stripped away all of that in the adaptation to make it more contemporary concerns that just wouldn't really have any, you know, people back then I think would hear, hear those and think, hmm. What, why is that a big deal? Similar to how maybe we would look at some of these issues and think, well, that's silly and not a big deal. But it was it was it was frustrating. But I have no memory of it other than not liking it. So I'm OK now. That's good. I still remember the uh, the book and um, and it's it's so fun because it is a great mystery but with a little bit of um, eeriness, you know, there are shadows and, uh, you know, listening outside of windows that, you know, in the, that you might slip and fall and get hurt if you're you know not careful um, in the dark, because you're trying to hear the, the schemings of, of people who are, don't have your best interests at heart. And of course the title itself, the woman in white, I mean, come on. Mm, um, yeah. I, I think a lot of people do read this again, thinking of my Instagram at this time of year, I get a lot of the woman in white and, and it does, does kind of feel like a good, uh, Halloween mystery kind of novel, even though um, in, in many ways it also isn't. I I do regret to say that even though I, I we read this as kind of one of the proto you know mystery novels, you know, getting getting closer to um, to Sherlock Holmes and things like that that would be starting. But I loved it so much, and then never went on to read more of Wilkie Collins' work. I've not read The Moonstone, for example. Is that silliness on my part uh, should uh, should i be saying hey let's go all in on wilkie collins or have i have i done yes. it already yes you should be <laughs> well when i was going to do wc <laughs> as one of my writers it was the moonstone i was going to uh-huh. bring up it's, it's a fixation of mine i i teach it in my class on mystery and detective fiction if you like that mystery element the moonstone is much more kind of pure detection but it has 
it maybe it's not quite as exuberantly delightful as the woman in white. I mean, the woman in white is just so full of, of delightful things like Count Fosco and his mice. <laughs> and it has that wonderful moment, right, where the woman in white first appears tapping Walter Hart right on the shoulder as he walks down the this quiet country lane. He just feels this tap on his shoulder and turns around and there's this mysterious woman and you almost think it's a ghost because he doesn't know who she is or where she came from. So the woman in white is super fun. But the Moonstone, it has multiple narrators, same as the woman in white. Some of them are just about as hilarious as the ones in, in the woman in white. And the plot is just a lot more, oh, I guess I would say maybe sophisticated. It, it's just really, um, it's just a really smart, smart novel. It's about a diamond, obviously the Moonstone diamond that's, that's stolen from a young girl's bedroom. But the underlying issue is that the diamond itself is basically the it's there because of colonial plunder. Mm. And so it, it's tied into all these issues about the British Empire and the violence of of imperialism and you know, who really is entitled to anything anyway in that whole world. And it it's really so there's that layer to it, but it's also very, very entertaining. So yeah, you have mm. you have treats in store. Yeah. Oh, uh, I have I did hope that's what you'd say. I kind of thought it might be. <laughs> Me too. I have yeah. even more treats in store because I have many gaps in my Victorian um readership and Wilkie Collins as a whole is one of them I have not read despite owning both of those books and eyeing them on my shelves frequently I have not read either one so yeah well, he is a master of suspense right I mean the woman in white will definitely keep you turning pages it might take you a few pages to kind of get the gist right. of it and, right. and it's helpful maybe sometimes to know that you don't stuck with the same narrator all the time so if you're like boy this person's really stuffy it's okay you'll get somebody else coming along and then you'll start to appreciate the the stuffiness of the other character as part of their you know, dramatization of, of mm -hmm. who they are. And he's really good at, isn't he, at capturing character through people's voices as they narrate. Yeah, so fun. Like like a dramatic monologue, but in, in prose. Mm. Yeah. But by the way, a little slight slight tangent before I had, um, so Michael Crawford did play Crown Fosco and he was in a big fat suit. I actually didn't know. I just uh. thought maybe he was really large, you know, when I was watching. He, he took eel at the end of 2004 because of oversweating in the fat suit. Oh, no. and, wow. uh, it was originally reported as the flu, but yeah, he didn't, he, he only played it for that very short period, uh, which was when I went to see it. So fortunately he's still around, you know, to, you know, that's good. That did, that wasn't the end of everything, but, uh, it sounds like in your opinion, bit of tri trivia. <laughs> yeah. It sounds like in your opinion, the sacrifice may not have been worth it. That's oh no, no, no. <laughs> he should just, uh, you know, read the book again. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> But all right, well, I am going to head out is Rowan. It was so delightful to, to meet you face to face, you know, after all of our time, it, it's a, uh, uh, again, I, it's so nice to, to just sit and, and, and hear you talk about these things because your, your intelligence of course comes out, your ability to analyze and express that, but your enthusiasm does too. And it's that combination that just makes it invigorating and exciting. And, um, you know, I, I am excited to, to continue my, my voyage, but I will, yeah. I will talk to you both later. Good. Thank you so much. It's just so fun to be here talking about all of this stuff. So thanks. Well, thank you. Yeah. So I will go ahead and kick off my second book, which is, I told you I'm not doing any deep dives and we've already talked about him quite a bit today, but my man, Charles Dickens. Um, and I was debating which book to talk about because I just couldn't have this discussion without bringing him up. And I thought, you know, I mean, I love David Copperfield. I love Great Expectations. But I thought I would just go for what many people consider the peak, the the masterpiece, which is Bleak House. Um, and so, you know, this ticks a lot of the Victorian boxes, I think. You know, Social Realism published as, what was it, 20 some episode serials over the course of a year and a half. Um, and of course, just, you know, he was well known for criticizing the the social system of the time. But this book is a great pastiche of kind of the the legal system, which ties in nicely with the Anthony Trollope discussion we've been having. Um, so it, you know, it all centers around this seemingly never ending court case. It's I don't know if you say Jarndyce or Jarndyce, but Jarndyce versus Jarndyce. Jarndyce. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's the, the basic idea is that there's these several conflicting wills that have just dragged on and on into obscurity and it's impacting all of these different people. And so the book is mostly narrated by Esther Summerson, who I found, I didn't realize this. I mean, it makes sense. She's actually Dickens' only female narrator, narrator which is kind of interesting. Um, 
So anyways, you know, as always with Dickens, it features an enormous cast of characters. You know, there's lawyers and other legal professionals. There's detectives. There's miners who are impacted by the guardianship around this whole, you know, law battle. There's somebody who's a rag and bottle merchant, a moneylender. You know, it just the list goes on and on. But for me, I mean, I love the characters, but with Dickens, what drives a lot of people crazy is the language, but it's also what I love. And I, I've read this passage before. I think I read it in our favorite opening um, passages of all time, but I, I am going to read it again because I just think it's so amazing. The Very much just the beginning of, of the novel. Um, London, Michaelmas term, lately over, and the Lord Chancellor sitting in Lincoln's Inn Hall, implacable November weather. As much mud in the streets as if the waters had but newly retired from the face of the earth. And it would not be wonderful to meet a Megalosaurus, forty feet long or so, waddling like an elephantine lizard up Holborn Hill, smoke lowering down from chimneys, pots making a soft black drizzle with flakes of soot in it as big as full-grown snowflakes, gone into mourning, one might imagine, for the death of the sun. Dogs undistinguishable in mire, horses scarcely better splashed to their very blinkers, foot passengers jostling one another's umbrellas in a general infection of ill temper and losing their foothold at street corners where tens of thousands of other foot passengers have been slipping and sliding since the day broke if the day ever broke adding new deposits to the crust upon crust of mud sticking at those points tenaciously to the pavement and accumulating at compound interest So, yeah, and then from there, it kind of wanders off into that famous passage about fog everywhere, fog up the river, which I absolutely love. I've read that before, and I I love the way that he uses that to introduce the city and kind of the murkiness of both the legal system, but also to introduce London as a character, which Dickens is so good at, you know, as the fog drifts through the different alleys and he talks about all the different, you know, people working and lighting the lamps and everything. So it's very... I know Dickensian is a cliche, but I I love the way he just kind of drifts straight into that. So I will always have a soft spot for David Copperfield, but this book is widely considered, I think, to be his masterpiece. And I'd say it's very well deserved. I was just thinking as I read this, I'm definitely due for a reread. So I don't know. Do you have any rankings for your Dickensian uh, love? Oh, Um, Bleak House is way, way up at the top along with David Copperfield. Absolutely. And I think... um... I mean, I haven't read all of Dickens, to be honest. And one of the reasons is, as I was saying before, I'm, I'm doing so much rereading that mm-hmm. sometimes you just don't have the time or the energy to go take on a whole new one. But at Bleak House, I do teach it anytime I dare. It's very long. It's quite a big undertaking. It takes a lot of weeks. But it is it is just so extraordinary. And I think the emphasis on Dickens as a kind of... Um, you know, chronicler of London, a chronicler of the poor and of social conditions and so on. It's all true, but it can sometimes miss how formally experimental he is. I mean, in Mm. a way, all of the novelists we're talking about are experimental because there were no MFAs, there were no craft books, there were no how-to guides for the novel. They were were all just making it up as they went along. And, And Dickens, to me, always just seems to be having such enormous fun finding mm. out how far he can take any idea he has and and in bleak house you know the passage that you read it's so extraordinary but then also you mentioned esther summerson as the as the first person narrator and i'm not sure how many other novels there are from any time period that alternate an omniscient prophetic third person narrator with that very intimate first person narration who's also kind of squirrely she's kind of unreliable you know so you have the fun of trying to figure out how far you should trust her version of events and then you have this great big booming voice on the other part and just yeah. going back and forth between them it's so provocative um, it, it just it just asks you so many questions like what should a novel do what can a novel do what happens if you do both of these things right absolutely yeah well i love it and i i agree i think dickens gets stereotyped and they all do to some degree but i would just hopefully maybe this conversation will encourage people who maybe have a certain idea of victorian literature in their head to give it another try because there's all kinds of stuff happening but well yeah do you want to go ahead and move on to your next book Yes, yeah, so it's no surprise probably to you that I picked George Eliot as one of the writers to talk about, but I thought I would, um, you know, buck expectations just a little bit by not bringing along Middlemarch to talk about, but instead bringing Silas Marner to talk about. Mm. It's it's a book that um, it won me over later than Middlemarch did. And I think uh, in my anecdotal experience, a lot of people have a bad first experience with Silas Marner because perhaps it's assigned to them in school, which is probably because it's short and and it comes across as maybe a little dour, a little humorless. And uh, I, I maybe had that impression of it for a while, too. And then I reread it 
a few years back and I really thought, wow, what a beautiful gem of a little novel this is. It has a similar story to A Christmas Carol, which of course everybody knows in one form or another. It's about the redemption of an old miser who's brought back to caring about other people by an extraordinary event. But what I just love about Silas Marner is that it's not a supernatural event. He's brought back into community by rediscovering love. What happens is he, his gold is taken and he's desperately looking for it. And he turns around and discovers what he thinks of as sort of in its place, a sort of magical replacement is this little golden haired girl. And of course, there are perfectly reasonable, natural, material explanations for this. And the novel partly engages us to think about why we explain things we don't understand by using supernatural or preternatural explanations, which is a bit of a commentary on, on religion, you know, that mm. it's something that we use, Eliot typically uh, has it, to explain things that we don't understand. But as our human understanding grows, we realize that there is no God or external being doing these things it's us it's all up mm, to us it's what we right. do it's what we don't do and and she doesn't really uh, hammer hard on that point here but the novel is a lot about how people interpret what happens but mostly it's just such a tender story about this sad sad man who is just bit by bit brought back into the human community and it's so tender and his love for his daughter his adopted daughter is so pure and it's also because she's adopted, it's really, it's a novel about chosen families, which is so timely, I think. It's about mm. about the primacy of care over the claim of of blood. You, know, you can't possess somebody because they, they are your blood relative. You need to show them the care that makes you a parent. And it, it just so... Um, it's so touching. It, so it, it goes a little slowly at first, and it's kind of... Um, it, it's kind of door for sure at the beginning because you're in the company with this old miser but as it keeps going and you start to see him soften to the world and people reach out to him and just feeling the the care of it uh, it's just it's just so nice if, if you'll indulge me i'll just read a little oh, a please. little piece of it. always uh, as the weeks grew to months the child created fresh links between his life and the lives from which he had hitherto shrunk continually into narrower isolation Unlike the gold, which needed nothing and must be worshipped in close-locked solitude, which was hidden away from the daylight, was deaf to the song of birds, and started to no human tones, Epi, the little girl, was a creature of endless claims and ever-growing desires, seeking and loving sunshine, and living sounds, and living movements. I'll skip a little bit ahead, but Epi called him away from his weaving and made him think all its pauses a holiday, reawakening his senses with her fresh life, even to the old winter flies that came crawling forth in the early spring sunshine, and warming him into joy because she had joy. And it's such a nice vision of, of that capacity of childhood innocence to just bring you back to the things that really matter instead of his miserly preoccupation with counting his coins he starts to notice the nature and the birds and the the flies and just that sense that his heart is opening up again to the world around him you don't get a lot of quite that kind of tenderness in Middlemarch which is absolutely a masterpiece perhaps perhaps the masterpiece of the period but when Elliot is talking about these smaller scale things, she shows a side to her that you don't always see. Parts of the mill and the floss are like this too, um, just about landscape and childhood and, mm -hmm. and just those warm strings that connect us to the places we live and the people that we love. It, it's such a, a kind of a humanizing and I think a kind of rejuvenating vision of what we can mean to each other, that it, it just, it, it just is so uplifting. So Silas Marner, a little book, a perfect little secular fable, a secular redemption story. It's about a child, you know, redeeming, but in these very, very small scale human ways. And I think for her, that was what religion could do at its best. It could give you a, mm. a sense of that reconnection. But she really does tend to show through her fiction that that really, if we look at ourselves, we don't need that explanation. We just have to rise to the occasion mm. and, and take and take responsibility. So, uh, so Silas I Marner, I just think is, is a, is a jewel of a little book. Yeah. You're making me want to pick it up and read it again. I read it a while back and I think <clears throat> I, I did appreciate it, but maybe I was already kind of looking ahead to middle March, you know, which is not a good thing to do, but sometimes I find myself doing that when, you know, there's this looming masterpiece, you're kind of like, I should read some of these other ones first before I get to, you know, the big one. But that makes me want to revisit it. It sounds absolutely wonderful the way you described it. So 
Yeah, it really makes a nice juxtaposition to A Christmas Carol because they do have such a strong plot element in common, the grouchy mm. old miser and the, the little child who brings him back. But you don't need any ghosts in Elliot's world. And although that's part of the fun of Dickens' world, right. uh, it's also part of the, the mystique of it. You know, it's, it's, uh, it, it takes the responsibility for that kind of redemption and, and puts it outside ourselves. Mm. And, and Elliot really, it's a big responsibility she tends to give us. You know, if things are going to change for the better, it's going to be because people make it change. If they, if they change for the worse, it's going to be because people do the harm. Mm. So, so she's really... Um, doing something that, that Dickens skirts around a little bit by by the fun of all the ghosts coming and the supernatural sort of right. magic, magic but of it. Very forward thinking and, and relevant as always, though. With, she's amazing. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a great yeah. choice. Well, thank you. So I will kind of move on to my last one. So we couldn't have this discussion without the Brontes, right? I mean, they had to be there. So I chose one that I've actually, I read it probably 15 or 20 years ago. And then just recently re-listened to it. And it's The Tenant of Wildfell Hall by Anne Bronte. I don't know that it's necessarily, you know, none of the Bronte's works are obscure, but I guess maybe compared to some of the really big ones that we hear about most often, it's, you know, on the lesser known side of things, I guess. But um, yeah, it held up so well on a re, re, it's so revisit. Good. It's so good. Yeah. And it has so many of those staples of Victorian literature that we've been talking about, you know, some creepy settings, that whole will they, won't they romantic plot that's kind of exacerbated by the social mores of the time. Um, and then, of course, just, you know, all kinds of other things around, you know, class and, um, you know, I don't know, all kinds of good stuff that that is very relevant to the Victorian period, I think. And um, so just to give a quick frame, it does have that that kind of, I guess, frame story that so many of the Victorian novels also have, where it starts off and it's written as a series of letters from Gilbert Markham to a friend of his, and he's kind of, you know, telling this story. And I was thinking to myself, man, if in real life, if somebody wrote letters quite this long and detailed, I wonder who would be able to hang in there. But um, yeah, so they recount how he came to know this mysterious widow named Helen Graham. And so she moves into this big dilapidated mansion that's in their part of the country, and it's known as Weldfell Hall. And along with her comes her young son and then one servant. And so it's kind of this mysterious thing. Nobody really knows why she's there, what her background is. And so, you know, the gossip mill starts churning and, um, you know, local residents begin to kind of spread these scandalous rumors about her. And it goes, you know, definitely touching on the, the fallen woman idea that we talked about with Tess. Um, so, you know, she quickly becomes pretty ostracized due to this, you know, due to the, the rumors and some of these things that are starting to spread. But Gilbert, who starts off pretty much in that camp and a little bit skeptical of her starts to get one over and, and quickly, you know, begins to change his tune, even finds himself starting to defend himself sometimes rather violently to the other people in his family and, and other residents of the area, you know, defending her. Um, but like I said, it's a, it's a slow burn. I, I really like it. It's one of those where she parcels out little bits, little bits, little bits and the, and the tension builds. Cause you have a better, you don't have an idea of everything that's going on, but sometimes you have more idea than some of the characters. So you're like seeing these miscommunications and misunderstandings, but then there's also the elements that you as the reader don't actually know yet. So, you know, as always, the Brontes are so good at building that suspense and I don't always mean to lump them together. I find myself doing that. I know they're all very different people, but I think they do share some commonalities of, of that ability to, you know, create the page turner over when you really think about it, not that much is happening. Um, so yeah, there's, a, I'll also just read a quick bit here that, um, you know, me, I always love the, the nature descriptions. And this is a part where Gilbert is first walking around and kind of in on the hillside, but approaching Wildfell Hall. And it says, I left the more frequented regions, the wooded valleys, the cornfields, and the meadowlands, and proceeded to mount the steep acclivity of Wildfell, the wildest and the loftiest eminence in our neighborhood, where, as you ascend, the hedges as well as the trees become scanty and stunted, the former at length giving place to rough stone fences, partly greened over with ivy and moss, the latter to larches and scotch fir trees, or isolated blackthorns. The fields, being rough and stony and wholly unfit for the plow, were mostly devoted to the posturing of sheep and cattle. The soil was thin and poor. Bits of gray rock here and there peeped out from the grassy hillocks. Relics of more savage wildness grew under the walls, and in many of the enclosures, ragweeds and rushes usurped supremacy over the scanty herbage. But these were not my property. And so you get that wild, you know, it's, it's what you always think of with 
the the Brontes. It's not necessarily the Moors. I don't know exactly. Maybe this is considered Moors. I don't know. But it's that whole rough, rugged landscape. And then I'll just skip ahead for a quick little bit more. It says, near the top of this hill, a superannuated mansion of the Elizabethan era, built of dark gray stone, venerable and picturesque to look at, but doubtless cold and gloomy enough to inhabit, with its thick stone mullions and little latticed panes, its time-eaten air holes, and its too lonely, too unsheltered situation, only shielded from the war of wind and weather by a group of Scotch firs, themselves half blighted with storms, and looking as stern and gloomy as the hall itself. And so it goes on from there, but it's just that wonderful, like, spooky, you know, gloomy, you know, I, I just, I eat that stuff up. So yeah, I absolutely love everything about this book. It's got all kinds of, like I said, the, the will they, the won't they kind of theme that goes through between these two is definitely what pulls you along, but along the yeah, way, oh boy, there's all nobody kinds of... sets the scene better than, than the Brontes. I, I agree oh, they yeah. are extinct, but they all have in common that, that ability to just paint the landscape for you and and with those little sort of murky shadows all around the mm-hmm. edges always so that you're sort of wondering it's also such a timely book again right because it's so much about male privilege you mentioned gilbert starts out kind of you know skeptical and he's really kind of a bit of a jerk at the start in oh, fact. he, and he had Absolutely. to go through this whole process of of um sort of realizing what he's assuming and what he's taking for granted and what he's trying to claim for his own without even earning it and then he, we get the backstory and it, you know, we can avoid all the spoilers, but we learn that that what Helen has been through has really taught her a lesson about male entitlement and male privilege, and and you know, the idea of making a man by letting them get away with anything, and and it mm. really brings you through that that romantic plot to a point where you say, well, if you're going to be a good husband to a woman that we think is pretty great, you're going to have to be better. You know, you're going to have to do better uh, than is yeah. conventionally expected of you, and there's something really satisfying about that, and it seems almost unhappily. Um, still so relevant that she could say in the 1840s, look, you, you can't just treat grown men like children, you know, mm-hmm. and indulge them and give them the run of the house and let them act like idiots and think that that's cool. If they're going to have all this power, they have to learn to use it responsibly or else they have to give it up. And that's the way this process of maturation has to go. Yeah. And she's really uncompromising. And it's such a shocking picture of all the drinking and the carousing and the abuse and the sort of thing that would have been kept behind the scenes. And you can see why these novels were considered, you know, not so polite when they oh, first right. came out. No, there's some yeah. very volatile, violent characters and she gets swept up into some of it in various ways. And that's another thing is we were talking about with Tess, how it's kind of poking at the idea of the fallen woman. And this definitely does it in a very, in various ways. But one of those ways is like, she is an artist. She right. paints, she makes money. She provides for herself and her son. She, you know, partially due to the the societal um, strictures, she doesn't really reveal her past very much. But I feel like there's also some strength in that. That's her choice to some degree as well. And she's willing to stick to her gun, so to speak. And, and you know, make, like you said, make him kind of earn it. And she's not going to just like fall fainting into his arms just because she feels a certain way about him. It's like, this is... To some degree, yeah, she's a really fought to, to get that autonomy, and she's mm-hmm. not going to just give it up. And yes, you point out how she has to deal with all the the gossip and the. Not only do they think, oh, maybe there's something morally wrong. They say maybe she's a witch, you know, a woman mm-hmm. living by herself. That can't be right. That's not normal. And she just has to has to stare that down and and be brave enough to keep doing it at at this enormous risk to herself. So, so she is, I think, a really a really impressive character, and and uh, she does does fight for her son, of course, which is kind of the get out of jail free card in a way for, for women in the period. If you're going to do something strong, if you say you're doing it for your family, that, that maybe allows you to stay womanly at the same time. So it can be a womanly kind of strength. And she's a very devout Christian. So there's that element running through the novel too, that mm-hmm. she's doing it to live up to her ideals, but in the face of so much opposition. Yeah. yeah but I absolutely. think too that, that, you know, if you talk about those things, you can lose track of what you started with. Like, it's just such an engrossing story. It's a mystery. What happened? Who is she? Where did she come mm-hmm. from? What will happen next? And how will the romance play out? I think we started our, our discussion for this whole episode talking about qualities that are Victorian. And I, I think maybe it's that, that marriage of the issues that really matter, the things that you know, we joke about earnestness, but the things that really deserve to be treated earnestly, but somehow using them to create something so dramatic 
that it has this kind of headlong forward impulse instead of feeling stuffy and didactic. It feels like, well, we really better figure this out. You know, we've got these people we care about. We're really invested in them. So, so we're going to get through to the end of this story. And that's a combination that I find really winning, that it's about things that matter, but it does it in a way that's, that's just dramatic or entertaining and it'll make you laugh and it'll make you cry. It'll make you anxious. <laughs> and yeah. that emotional engagement is just the most precious part of it. Really. I find mm. that, um, Maybe too often today I'm reading fiction that is really meticulously crafted in a way that a lot of these novels maybe aren't. You can find plot holes and you can find sentences that are kind of shoddy and digressions that maybe you can't make up an excuse for. But on the other hand, if you craft it so perfectly that you take all the all the buoyancy out of it, you always have this feeling that someone is very carefully choosing their words. I think there's a risk of going the other way, that you have this experience of fiction as something that's so cerebral and so intellectual or so careful you're not taking the risks you're not just cracking things open to see what's inside and you know like dickens and bleak house he just gives you everything you know it's just everything and mm. i can see how that's not everybody's favorite thing but it certainly has a kind of excitement that that is maybe too rare for me as a reader today oh i love that i mean i know we've gone on for quite a long time and said a lot of wonderful things. I think that's a great way to wrap up unless you have anything else that you'd like to add. I think that sums it up perfectly. No, I think that's as good a note to stop on as, uh, as any as well. It's just been so, so fun. We could probably go on for another two oh, hours, but I think easily taxing for your, for your <laughs> listeners. So we always test their patience, but I think in the long run, most of them yeah. stick around. They can listen to it in segments, but yeah, no, thank you so much. This has been an absolutely wonderful conversation. You have done exactly what I knew you would do and, and made me want to pull a bunch of these books off my shelves and get back into this world of, you know, messiness and gloominess and, and all these other things that we talked about. It's, it's just a beautiful place to be. So well, thank I you. feel lucky all over again that I get to go and do this for my day job too. I have to, I have to read Jane Eyre. I'm reading Tenant of Wild Fall Hall next term for another oh. course. So, so I'm reminded again that, that that's a real treat and absolutely, I can, I can take some courage and fun from that. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Your students are very lucky to have you. And I really appreciate you taking the time to, to spend with us. It's been delightful. So maybe we'll have you back on again one of these days. But thank you so much. And thanks, everybody, for listening in. We'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Mooks and the Gripes podcast. You can follow the Mooks and the Gripes and get show notes and book and film reviews at mooksandgripes.com. On Twitter, you can find Trevor at Mooks and Paul at BiblioPaul. You can also get information about future shows on our Patreon. If you'd like to donate to the show, anything and everything, even a dollar a month, helps and is deeply appreciated. You can become a patron at patreon.com slash mooks. Until next time.